going again. I guess a few more people will slide in as they finish up uh, all those nice uh, cookies and things. Um, so next up, um, we have uh, Creighton Barrett, uh, Phil Ledger, uh, Ledger um, Roger Gillis, and Maria Spear. Um, and I'll turn it over to you guys. Are your mics on? It will be. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope we all enjoyed our lovely lunch. And yes, thanks for, for joining us today. Um, I wanted to start briefly with um, a few land acknowledgements. Uh, we all work at, at Dalhousie University, and Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, and we we're all treaty people. And we also recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories and legacies and and contributions have enriched uh, this part of Mi'kma'ki known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. Um, so uh, I'm Roger Gillis. I'm a digital archivist uh, at Dalhousie University Archives here in Halifax. And it's my colleagues, um, Creighton Barrett, uh, Acquisitions and Public Services ar Archivist, um, our digital asset technician, Phil Lawfer, and uh, Maria Spear, who is our archival assistant on this project that we're gonna tell you all about today. And uh, Maria is a um, master's student in musicology, focusing broadly on performance and disability in popular music. Um, so first, going to pass it over to Creighton to give you some background on our project. Thanks, Roger. Uh, so I'm just going to start by providing some background on uh, on, on Dalhousie, some context. Uh, the Fountain School of Performing Arts, which we'll refer to as the Fountain School, was established in 2014 through the merger of our Department of Theatre and the Department of Music. Uh, about a year later, in 2015, department staff uh, brought a box of video cassettes to the University Archives. Um, the box included uh, recordings of theatre department productions uh, from the late 70s to 2014. Uh, with a, a kind of concentration in the 1990s. So the archive staff, uh, we accessioned this material. There were uh, uh, over 100 tapes, uh, mostly 8 millimeter, but there was VHS, there was Umatic, uh, mini DVs, there were Blu-ray discs. Uh, so it was a kind of a, a wide assortment of formats. Um, Maria and Phil are going to talk more about the specifics of what we received. So, um, but the main point is that uh, it was hundreds of hours of uh, uh, footage of theater production spanning almost 40 years. Um, and it was inaccessible. Yes, this is the clicker. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We've got it. I'm, yeah, thank you. We're operating from different. Uh, yeah, different. different. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. thanks, Roger. Okay. Um, like many archival repositories, we have a large collection of audiovisual material that is hidden and at risk due to obsolescence and decay, uh, lack of playback equipment, uh, inadequate metadata, and a variety of other factors. Uh, and when the school delivered this collection, we were engaged in some exploratory work around audiovisual digitization. Uh, it was a bit random what we were selecting. They were uh, almost like research projects or pilot projects that uh, were kind of focused on designing workflows and technical specifications, looking at partnerships, and uh, just kind of working on capacity building. So uh, that was the context for when this material came to us. It was very timely, and we ended up uh, sending the entire batch of material out to be uh, digitized. Uh, we the vendor returned the cassettes uh, and four external hard drives with terabytes of of data uh, that we transferred to a storage environment. Uh, we put the physical me media in storage. Um, we had a basic inventory of the material, but it was still uncatalogued and essentially inaccessible. Um, so I, at that stage, I would still call it a hidden collection. Uh, we didn't have a finding aid or anything that allowed people to know what we had. Great. Um, so here's an ex uh, just an example. This is a still from a 1983 VHS recording of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, the quality is what you might expect from a VHS tape recorded in the 1980s. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, 
When this material uh, came to us, we were also deeply involved in efforts to develop uh, digital preservation uh, infrastructure and processes that were aligned with you know, international digital preservation standards. We were also in the process of finalizing a university-wide records management policy that was approved in 2016. So this transfer was kind of unexpected, but it also represented what we thought we were going to be getting, which was uh, a deluge of analog and digital records transferred from various places across the university. Uh, in, in 2018, we released a public tender for digital preservation services. And uh, we also hired our first university records manager, uh, Courtney Bain, who is uh, not here today. But um, so there was a lot of other things happening. And uh, later that year, we signed uh, a three-year agreement with Artifactual Systems to start developing our digital preservation infrastructure. So we were kind of, you know, shifting gears into that. We were we were doing less audiovisual digitization at that point, but um, that content was helping us to kind of develop the overall system. Um, and so the whole uh, whole point of this preservation work is so that we can provide access to our collections um it in storage for a number of years and then in february 2022 we received a routine reference question that involved a, a specific production uh Bertolt Brecht's uh Caucasian chalk circle so there was a faculty member who was involved and they were looking for footage of the play and that request prompted a whole flurry of activity that uh culminated in the project that we're uh we're here to to share today we had a recording of the production and we were able to fulfill the request, uh, but it highlighted uh, a number of questions and challenges, such as uh, who can access this material and how, uh, what do we even have, and um, and uh, some other intellectual property uh, questions that Roger is going to speak about. So through, through winter 22, we started looking at this content again, and we were finally in a position to start moving material into our digital preservation system. Um, so we had a graduate student intern, um, Elise Batson, she, uh, she did some cataloging, uh, just kind of, again, more exploratory work, uh, but we didn't have the resources to kind of manage this material um, or curate it in a timely, uh, a timely manner. So we started talking about the scope of work and what we could do with, with the Fountain School. Um, thank you. It would be nice if they were synced, but they're not. Um, right. So we were discussing uh, work with the Fountain School. Uh, and I do think that exploratory work helped us get a sense of what was what we had and what we needed to do to get this material ingested into Archimatica and uh, get it fully cataloged. Um, and it also kind of opened up conversations around transferring additional recordings because this came to us several years ago and in 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 the midst of all of this, they were continuing to present theater and music productions um, and record them. So uh, we worked on a project proposal that was uh, submitted to the school in December 2022, um, and it outlined um, a, a few goals uh, to develop procedures for transferring digital video and audio recordings to the archives, um, to develop some processes for providing access to this content to individuals who are authorized to, 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 to view it, um, you know, just cataloging the digital video cassettes and um, uh, and to transfer and catalog the uh, born digital recordings that the school had been creating uh, in the years after the transfer of the video cassettes. Uh, that proposal also requested uh, $12,000 uh, from the school um, to hire a graduate student that would join our team and help us complete this work. Um, so there, there is a bit of a theme with all of this. Um, we were doing a project that was designed to achieve something, but also help us, you know, develop processes or workflows. Um, this is kind of how things were working. Uh, the Fountain School approved the project in spring of 2023. Uh, so that was very exciting. It was not um, the, the, the first time that we've done something like this, but it's unusual for us to kind of get to this stage with another unit. Um, and then, of course, we had all this work that we now had to do. 
uh, so we we started with a, a a project charter that kind of refined some of the things that were in the proposal, but it had the same kind of components here. There was the uh, goals and objectives, the scope of our work, uh, time frame, and and deliverables. Um, and even though it was kind of similar, I think it was helpful for us to revisit, uh, you know, uh, this project uh, with with certainty of funding to kind of really make sure that we understood the scope of what we were trying to do. And um, uh, so this slide, uh, this provides a timeline of what I've kind of outlined. Um, I, I just wanted to give some of this historical context to the project that we're going to be talking about. Um, it really, most of it took place over the course of a few months this summer, but uh, it's the culmination of several years of work around our audiovisual archival collections, uh, digitization program, and uh, digital preservation. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Maria, who's going to talk about the collection and uh, her work on description. Yes, yeah, so I was, oh, how do I do this? The green the green yeah. yeah, so I was hired to work, I was hired by the Fountain School to work with the, the collection um, from May through like the beginning of September. Um, primarily because of my time in the, the Masters of Musicology program. So I'm in my second year of the program, um, and so I have a lot of experience in writing about performance on a pretty in-depth level. And I had previously worked for the school writing program notes and um, Dal News articles, and um, this kind of combined with my background in theater, I had sort of a foundation of knowledge that meant that I approached the the collection with, I think, sort of a useful background. Um, so the several sort of hundred of hours of footage in the collection chronicled the, the majority of the school's theater and music productions. And it ended up, when we pared everything down, ended up kind of being from the mid eighties to the present. And amongst the sort of clearly labeled or easily understood items, there were also quite a few sort of surprises. Um, There was a group of videos I affectionately dubbed the Czech Conspiracy that consisted of apparently related items that didn't fit within the nested structure that we'd established for cataloging the material. And this was, it ended up being a, a selection of candid footage shot in, I think, the mid-90s from a prof's vacation in the Czech Republic, as well as a Czech language play that must have sort of found its way into the box of VHS tapes at some point. Um, there was a great deal of video of in-class presentations and performances, um, primarily year-end projects from theater students. Uh, these were different from sort of the large-scale productions that were put on by the department. And the discovery of this material kind of led to a lot of discussions about sort of archival appraisal and the relevance of keeping these items over the these large-scale productions. Uh, and then there were some really sort of strange and wonderful discoveries. Uh, <laughs> these included a full bootlegged copy of the 1925 Russian silent film Battleship Potemkin. <laughs> Don't know how I got in there. As well as a two minute stop motion student project of a claymation wizard traversing a forest, which I still don't know what class it was from, who made it, but it's like my favorite thing in the whole collection. Um, so one of my earliest tasks in starting my position was simply to download and watch pretty much every video in the collection and just figure out what the material was and sifting through hundreds of items in order to discern what was a production recording and what was superfluous to the project's aims took a significant amount of time and whittled down uh, the number of items in the collection by about 40. So I relied on a number of sources in order to glean the information necessary to describe the items in the collection. One was the 2008 version of Rad, which became a dear friend to me and a light in the darkness. <laughs> and thankfully I was able uh, to primarily use the theater department's programs and posters that were already housed by the archives to pull information about production dates, directors, producers, music supervisors, and where the productions were staged. And also found it necessary to include titles and authors of each productions, each production in the descriptions themselves. And then in the absence of a program or poster, I had to do some detective work in order to get the information I needed, uh, which is where the archives catalog came into play, which it has pretty much every back issue of the Dalhousie Gazette 
uh, which is the university student newspaper dating back to like the 19th century. So I was able to approximate years for some productions based on either what was written on the physical tape or just by watching the actual material. And then I was able to search the catalog for issues of the Gazette during specific years and then see which ones made reference to or advertised the production on which I was working. And sometimes this would be a review after the fact, or sometimes there would be like a tiny lower third ad that included the name of a production and its date range. And the information I chose to include in the descriptions was based on what I would find most useful if I was trying to access an item from the perspective of an art student. So we had some discussions about including the names of the lead actors or maybe a brief logline about the actual content of a production. But I came to the conclusion that if a student was seeking out a video of a specific play, then they already knew the content of the play that they were looking for, and that so many of the productions were ensemble pieces that it would be difficult to choose which students' names got top billing like in the catalog. So in determining what we were keeping from the long list of items, we had to come up with a structure that not only accommodated the material, but made sense from the perspective of the standards of archival cataloging. And we settled on creating a Sioux font of the arts and social sciences font entitled Stage Productions, which were then divided into series by production season. And this was another choice that was made based on accessibility from the perspective of an art student. Uh, so it's consistent across amateur and professional music and theater that any sort of large scale production um, are is advertised and sort of organized internally by the season in which they're performed. And in the case of those produced by the Fountain School, uh, the season is the academic school year. So for example, a production of The Art of Success, which ran from November 30th to December 4th of 1993, can be found under the series heading of 1993 to 1994 season. And this also makes search functionality and navigation easier. Uh, so users able to view chronologically the list of production seasons, select the subseries name that corresponds with the production records for which they're looking, and view all of the records we have associated with the production, um, which at this point includes the video of the performance as well as the program for most of those productions. Phil. All right, so uh, the Fountain School performance videos, they were transferred into the Dell archives in two accessions. So the first accession came in, two, as this great mention came in 2015, and it was all analog, so it was made up of about 187 performances um, created on VHS, umatic tapes, eight millimeter tapes, with more recent performances on uh, rewrite, rewritable DVDs, and uh, they covered up until about 2014. Now these performances were digitized externally in 2016, the vendor ripped the raw data from these video carriers into stable archival video formats, performed normalization to make for compressed small or excessively sized video files in widely used formats for dissemination. Now, unlike other analog records, like text and photos where the data is available for a long time, if stored properly, uh, these, uh, these more modern information carriers are subject to data loss uh, in only a couple of years. Uh, format obsolescence, ever-present problem in archives, and the rapid change of what the popular media carrier du jour is, uh, coupled with the regular degradation of the carriers, poses an existential threat to the data stored on them. Now, factor in the dwindling number of people capable of uh, you know, operating and maintaining these this equipment, or the likelihood of even being able to obtain players to begin with, digitizing the tapes and discs soon after accession was pretty much essential in setting the groundwork for uh, future preservation. And then we switch. Yeah, we did. Okay, excellent. Uh, the second accession from uh, 2023 was born digital. So it was made up of about 111 individual performances from 2015 to present and was transferred to the archives through a lengthy file transfer process from Fountain School OneDrives. Now, these folders uh, were transferred onto the Dell Archive Secure JScape transfer server, kind of like a way station for uh, storing digital files prior to preservation. And uh, unlike with the analog records that were sent to the vendor for digitization and tied to physical items, the digital accession contained uh, many formats with inconsistent file naming and performance net metadata, which, you know, when adding them to the finding aid made for much detect work, as Maria pointed out. Uh, metadata on the analog carriers themselves made identification much easier than, say, a, uh, an individual file folder containing a single file titled chloe.mp4. Um, uh, earlier, uh, earlier FAST sessions included the uh, supported uh, Fountain School material, as uh, Maria pointed out, with po programs and posters they added in the descriptive work. Uh, we'd scanned and made accessible all these programs and posters, about 100 in all, uh, after the description of the videos was complete. And these uh, programs and posters also kind of made up for a made for a searchable, colorful addition to the finding aid in the face of uh, intellectual property concerns, which prevent public display of performances themselves, which we'll get into a bit later. 
Uh, 13 terabytes of digital, vid digital video files made up these two accessions, and they currently account for about 83% of all of our digitally preserved archival records. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of these files were transferred at ingest, ingest speeds that uh, would have been great for someone scouring Napster for music in 2001, less so when transferring 140 gigabytes of raw and compressed video data at a time, so pretty uh, time consuming. And uh, establishing naming conventions and rigid, rigid file hierarchies, it's essential for a project like this. Uh, without it, it's exceedingly difficult to locate the files you need when you need them. And in digital preservation workflows, having even the slightest deviation from the standard is a non-starter. None of your files are going to go where you want them to go. And uh, Dal's arch Dal Archives uses artifactuals uh, infrastructure, as Creighton pointed out. Uh, so we have uh, Archimatic for our digital preservation platform and uh, Atom for our public access catalog. So when submitting a digital preservation job, file hierarchy is dictated by artifactual must be maintained. So let's, uh, we'll begin at like, the top level. So the top level creates this thing called a bag containing all the archival and it's the archival information package, also known as the ape. Now it's what's going to be digitally preserved uh, and holds all the raw and compressed data. It's uh, your large files, so your TIFFs, if you're scanning a uh, video, scanning text or pictures, waves for audio recordings, and for our purposes, uh, MOV and AVI files for videos. And within this, there's two subdirectories. So the first is metadata. It contains uh, well, metadata. It's got XML metadata files, uh, photographs of physical carriers, and other files related to the preservation copies. And the second, uh, it's uh, called access. Uh, contains a copy of the access file that would be shared with the user. It's a compressed, but still of high quality in a widely accepted format. All these files, the raw and compressed uh, originals, the metadata, the access copy, they make up the eight. That access subdirectory also creates a second bag, which is the dissemination information package or the DIP. And uh, this is what will be disseminated to the finding aid. Uh, in Fountain School records, the DIP's made up of one or more MP4 video files created through normalization processes, either by digitizing the digitizing vendor or by Archimatica itself. And uh, the naming conventions sure. we used for the project varied by accession. So for the analog accession, we had the physical items in our collection, and we determined that the best way to locate uh, their digital representations was to build the naming conventions on the basis of uh, their physical location. So for instance, uh, in the 2006-2007 Fountain School season, there was a performance of August Strindberg's A Dream Play, and the reference code is built kind of as follows. We got it up there, do we? Yeah, we do. Okay, good. Uh, so UA for uh, university records, uh, 11 for Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences records, 2015-008, which is our accession number, 5, which is the box in that in sequence in that accession, and 24, which is the video in sequence in that box in that accession. And uh, every file name related be to the physical item began with that as the basis of the reference code. So we knew where the physical item was stored, when we acquired it, and everything associated with the item shared its prefix. Oops. So uh, the, for the digital accession, there were no physical carriers to relate back to, so naming conventions were different. Still the collection code in the accession, but then using Maria's detective work and to determine season, title, performance, or name of performer for music recitals, we use that as the main way of building our file names. So for ingest to work, uh, the naming convention has to be 100% consistent, and file hierarchy has to be completely in line with artifactuals requirements. So if you stick like an access or a master suffix at the end of your video files there, is it bad? Something as innocuous as naming the access folder with a capital A could cause a bunch of errors. So attention to detail is imperative. And then you know, even following all these instructions to a T might still cause problems. Adding the ape to Archivmatica takes more than 50 microtasks. So you're verifying file hierarchies, creating unique identifiers, scanning for viruses, and so on. When you're ingesting the dip into the archive catalog, it's even more complicated. There's more than 100 automated microtasks, which is like making thumbnails, normalization processes, making creating metadata, storage locations, and then uploading the dip to the catalog. Even one hiccup results in failed ingests and having to start all over again, which is a real frustrating process starting over again, given the file size involved, low transfer speeds, all because of misplaced capital A. And uh, the, the creation of these unique identifiers, uh, which was one of the micro tasks in the, uh, the uh, in initial transfer of the ape, uh, it uh, makes it easier to retrieve from uh, long-term storage. So it creates a 32-digit uh, unique identifier, it only applies to that individual file. It's kind of like DOIs and handles where it's stable. And it adds another way to map items back to the catalog, uh, from the catalog to their physical and digital storage locations. And you know, it helps aid in any future migration to a different platform as well. Uh, you know, the more options to accurately map the movement and storage records, the better. 
And uh, ripping DVDs, they created even more problems regarding file hierarchy by generating a whole bunch of extra files. Uh, we, we want to create accurate digital representations of these physical objects. And uh, yes, access copies were created, but there was also a whole bunch of other files, namely non-archival ISO format carriers. Now, an ISO is a disk image file, kind of serves as an interface allowing for uh, playback of a DVD video with menus intact without requiring access to the disk. Now, we want to preserve this carrier and it's an accompanying files, but Archimatica didn't know how to handle such non-archival formats and standard ingests failed. The whole, well, there we go. A whole lot of those red bars there, not just the one. And uh, we a whole lot of trial and error, no solution. So it's like, leave it as is, fail. Extract the ISO and ingest it that way, fail. Delete the ISO, hey, it works, but we're not exactly preserving the item, which led to another lengthy process. And, you know, we contact Artifactual. They really didn't have any answers as to how to solve this. So we poked through, kind of poking around the internet looking for ideas and came across an old Google Groups archive message thread, which uh, found a thread uh, positing that, you know, an ISO file could be ingested if it's nested in a subdirectory. It's like, okay, we haven't tried that yet, uh, but we don't really want to make it accessible. Uh, so we didn't really want to stick it in that access folder. So we decided to stick it in the metadata folder, which was all pictures and uh, XML files. And we ran a test run, no red bars, everything ingests properly, success, hallelujah. All DVDs then ended up being ingested, and you know, it was uh, it may not show here, but there's a whole lot of trial and error and time consuming and pulling out hair and whatnot to, to solve this problem. And you know, coming to this uh, coming to a solution is going to aid immensely in future fountain accessions as well as any other digitized uh, collections we decide to go under the same format uh, in future. And uh, Roger's going to get into intellectual property questions shortly, but uh, it's kind of at the center of access to this collection, basically. We can't display publicly display the access copies of these performances. We still want to denote in Adam that we have copies of the performances and what it entails. So what are we actually sending to the catalog? How uh, to submit an ingest, we need two things. Uh, what we're ingesting, which is the eight and the dip, and where we're sending it, which is the location in the finding aid. So in Adam, each archival description has its own identifier and we call it a slug. So it's kind of like a chunk of a URL uh, linking to a description in the finding aid. And as we arranged all the performances by season, uh, these would kind of serve as the targets for all these ingests. So for instance, with the Dream Play production, which I mentioned earlier, Box 5, Video 24, it was performed in 2006, 2007. So transfer submission contained the directory that had the preservation and access copies of the metadata. And uh, the access system ID would direct the access copy to go to that season in Adam. And but we still can't disseminate the video in the catalog, though. So to get around this, we had to create kind of like separate transfer configurations, uh, undertaking the same steps as preserving the ape, but also preserving the dip for future uh, future access. And once they're both stored, we kind of we conducted uh, what's called a metadata only dip upload, uh, which creates a you know like a dummy item level description in the finding aid to be populated by useful metadata related to the files and uh, to build a, a archival description. So on the public side, the user can see the file name, media type file size, when it was ingested, and it's nested under its correct fountain school performance season. The back end also maps back to that unique identifier, so it makes for easy retrieval of the, the um, ape or the dip whenever it's requested. And now while we cannot publicly display the videos, we can display the metadata associated with those videos to help direct future access. And Roger's going to get into uh, intellectual property questions dictated in uh, the collection and uh, how requesters can go about access. Yeah, so um, as has been alluded to previously, addressing some of the issues around access and intellectual property with these recordings has proved to be quite tricky with a lot of issues at play. Uh, so one of the tools that we have at our disposal is something that we developed uh, several years back um, called the Copyright Tools for Library, which is sort of like a assessment framework that we use for digitizing and assessing collections, which we can and, and cannot digitize or some we have to keep under lock and key, uh, such as this one. So um, we, uh, as part of this, we use kind of a risk management framework. And risk in this context means the likelihood that the online dissemination of the materials without the permission of the copyright owner would lead to claims of copyright infringement or otherwise expose us to uh, possible liability damages. Um, and this assessment usually leads to one of two um, determinations. One is that it's, it's low risk and that we can disseminate these material uh, without requiring the copyright permission. So we're sort of like just 
kind of going for it, but not necessarily going back and seeking permission. And then the high risk, so that we will, um, if we need to go back and seek the copyright owner's permission for disseminating these materials. So in this particular case, um, these materials fell into the high risk category. And this is due to the kind of multi-layered nature of these recordings. So we had, you know, things like creator rights for the original compositions, the ownership of the copyrighted performance that involved both students and faculty. Um, so the effort involved in going back and figuring out who owns what rights and getting the permission, uh, that would just be um, entirely too onerous and we're far too lazy for that. So, um, we just we didn't we didn't do that, and for a whole host of reasons that we uh, we just needed to um, uh, keep this collection kind of more uh, locked down. Even though there were some justifications that are copy that we could use, if, especially with respect to the the analog formats that we were um, you know taking preservation access to to do that to preserve them, and uh, that that could be justified. But publishing them online and making them available. Um, was was really not not on the table and something also that our main uh, stakeholder the fountain school um was pretty cautious about as well so they didn't want these these made available and they had um the reasons uh for for wanting that to be the case so we had to to kind of work with them around that and then bringing about the need for the the no dip workflow that that phil has mentioned um so um that was sort of what we more or less settled on and in a, a happy medium as as we could we could do, um, but there were cases in which this material did have to be made available, and when people requested it, and we had to to kind of look at those requests and provide access when we needed to. Um, um, so there's different scenarios within the Fountain School that they had where um, we didn't really think about when we were. Um, thinking about this collection that they had and certain circumstances under which students would come back to them and say, request these materials if they had like a, um, a job interview and, um, or they need to, to showcase their work. This was actually like kind of like a scholarly output for them. And um, so we, we had to kind of make uh, accommodations for those scenarios in which um, they would come back and we would sort of dig them up and the in this case uh, rather than i mean this is still early days that we're not we haven't seen too many of these re requests or if we've seen any at all at this point um but they would often be mediated through the, the fountain school which is a different approach than what we're used to because to, typically users would come right to the archives and then we would be able to mediate those requests but in this case they came uh, directly to the school um, but it, at least we're able to kind of point them in the direction of the finding aid um, much more in terms of making that collection available and, and able to, to access, at least in the sense of the metadata, but not the actual uh, objects and performance that, uh, themselves. Um, so uh, we're, we're sort of taking this as it comes and seeing like, okay, you know, who comes and, and requests access and and there's like, process involved whereby they have to sign a, a waiver that they will like share it on social media and kind of keep it to the express purpose for which they're they're accessing it. Um, so we need to kind of be mindful of that um, going forward. And uh, yeah, so I think this will be a very uh, kind of a departure from from usual practice, but we'll we'll kind of see how it goes. And if, if it becomes overly onerous, we might have to like think of a, uh, a system where we can provide maybe a kind of closed access so a kind of virtual reading room type of thing but we're not we're not quite there yet and we're just kind of seeing uh, how many of these requests we tend to get um, so we shall see um, how it goes um, yeah but um, what we've got we're getting close to time we're gonna just move right on so um Thanks. Yeah. So I think we'll just wrap up with a few uh, lessons learned and future considerations. Um, and the first is really addresses uh, records management and that question of, uh, you know, requests for access. Uh, for those of you that work with records, you, you know, like active records that are being used stay with the unit. 
not in the archive. So that's kind of one of those uh, questions. Um, uh, uh, and even getting the materials. We talked about how to transfer the files. Uh, one of our objectives was to kind of develop a coordinated approach to transferring digital files, these large video files over the network from the Fountain School to the archives. Um, and we were going to achieve that directive, uh, that objective with written procedures and technical specifications for doing that work. Um, and I think in retrospect, this the, the objective really should have uh, focused on records management processes and um, classification and retention schedules that we still don't have for this type of content. And um, and those schedules would outline how how long they need to be held by the school and when they get sent. Um, so there's uh, still some work to do there. I won't say too much more in the interest of time. Um, um, but we, the, the main point is that we don't really know what a schedule would say in terms of how long they should keep the records. And because of that, um, it felt premature to write any kind of procedures or specifications on how to move the files because in three or four or five years, the technical infrastructure uh, is going to be different, uh, undoubtedly. Um, so I, um, yeah, records management in hindsight would have been a, a better way to sort of frame that, that objective. Yeah, and I'll just say briefly, um, this really, this project really highlighted around us for the issues involved in like working with different file formats and having, like, in addition to retention schedules, having like file formats that we we want to see come in rather than just like everything under the kitchen sink and like, giving us all all kinds of stuff that that made Phil cry and we don't want that happen again. <laughs> And did you want to speak to your? I uh, forgot the time. <laughs> Six minutes. Number of challenges. So that, yep. yeah. Um, I think we'll leave it at that. All right. Thank you very much, guys. That was, that was very well. We, we do have some time for questions. So. Hi, I don't know how much of a problem the file naming conventions were, but if it's a like a problem of like manual entry, uh, was it considered or like uh, could you uh, use a command like grep to just output the ones that may, you know, raise some issues before importing and then getting back the results? Or was it more of an issue of the file format? And that was just like, you know, a fun little side thing about the A. I think, I mean, I had mentioned that the digitization project was kind of meant to help us develop processes for doing things. And, and this project was kind of similar. There's there's a, a lot of things that are still in flux and in development and um, using a tool like that, like if we were doing this on a, you know, uh, uh, ongoing kind of production type basis, then, then yeah, using tools to kind of fix those issues uh, would be totally applicable, but um, it, in the kind of pilot phase of doing this and trying to figure out fundamentally, like how do we structure the package so that Archimatica accepts it in a way that it will do what we want it to do. Uh, and, and the number of files that we were actually dealing with, it was just um, fiddly manual kind of work to to figure out what it, we actually needed to do. Yeah, kind of kind of like a reinventing the wheel unnecessarily, but it was our first try, try at it. Yeah. So it's it, it's what worked for us at the time, and it's definitely something to take into account uh, with uh, undoubtedly future uh, projects along this line. I'm quite interested in this in this business that you've got the stuff archived, but it's not publicly available. Under what circumstances would someone be able to view the file using the ISO? So essentially, run it as as if it were a, a CD. Um, and um, does your system take that into, I mean, at least for scholarly research purposes or what have you, it, it, does your system set up so that it will automatically tie visual files to ISO files and boot the thing up and run it? Uh, yeah, it, it run some trials on it and uh, it's it, it not compatible with every single sort of player I found. Uh, the, was it the Windows Media Player 10 seems to work 
the best amongst them. Um, and that's the kind of thing maybe uh, we may have to enhance in the finding aid or perhaps at like the collection level um, just to identify the kind of programs that work best with this kind of software. And uh, yeah, it's it's worked quite well in tests anyways. Oh, Hi, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, without sowing too much controversy for you, um, whether the amount of risk that you saw the benefit of taking on with copyright concerns might have been a different level than, as you sort of alluded to, your main stakeholder was comfortable with. Um, if you're on the same page, cool. If you weren't, I'm curious how you address that. Yeah, I guess. We really, they they funded the project too. So I think that that kind of fed into us, us kind of having to to go with their concerns too. But um, yeah, that's interesting because we haven't really had that conversation just yet in, in respect to digitization. I mean, we've been actively digitizing for a while, like what our appetite for risk is. Um, and I know we've, we've used this, um, the same thing before, the same framework and the thought, well, um, you know, we'll just kind of digitize it all sort of all later. And it has it has come back to bit us bite us in a few situations where we have people come back. And we have takedown protocols in place for that. So that's part of our framework is people have requested that we, you know, we have digitized stuff and they've uh, we've had to take it down as a result of them uh, uh, raising issues with us. Um, yeah, but with this particular situation, it wasn't it wasn't something we were totally comfortable with. But in other situations, it's really on a case by case basis whether um, yeah, that appetite for risk is there. I think just to add to that too, uh, the, the, there's a difference between like viewing things in the in the library than than putting it online, right? And so like that that was where that assessment kind of came from was like the online access. And if it was a private collection of video we may have come to a different conclusion about that risk assessment. Like we have other sort of content that is available online from private donations. This is like an institutional collection though. And so it was a different factoring of, of the, you know, criteria, I guess. Have you checked to make sure you don't have any long lost missing footage from the battleship Potemkin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like 20 that, yeah. seconds that no one else has. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And um, next up, I think.